Hello and welcome. My name is Stefan Poschik from CHC Corporate Health Consulting, and you are listening to the newest episode of our CHC Expert Interviews, where it is all about the future of entrepreneurship on how you can grow your business and multiply your revenue. So if you want to achieve higher goals, better goals, more in the next year, you are on the right place at the right time. And today I have a really, really interesting guest. I met him a couple of weeks ago, actually, on the biggest HR event in Austria with way over 5,000 people, where I had the honor to be on stage with him. And he's going to tell us a lot more about the future. So hello and welcome, Tristan Hoax. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, as you already mentioned, the future is my business. I'm from this weird job field called futurology or futurism, and it is coupled with trend research. So my is my job to understand the present by analyzing trends and then making predictions on how they develop. And it's a, you know, it's a niche. It's a small field, but I do um, truly enjoy doing it. I'm still very young for this business has to be said most futurists are kind of usually old guys with long gray beards um i'm 30 so <laughs> i'm a little bit behind that you know the beard is slowly starting to grow now that it's winter um other than that what i mainly do is i do speeches keynotes right so i travel from company to company mainly in europe sometimes in, in the us as well and basically give inputs on how the future can be created. And my focus is especially on the question of generation. And when it comes to the workplace, which I'm sure we will still discuss, oh, yeah. you can see that generational discourse and generational conflict is the big thing at the moment. Um, so I I got quite lucky with my with the field of research that I picked, but I'm a futurist, so you know, it's not surprising that I hit the right time, right? <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> awesome. So let's jump right into the topic. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you is, how are we going to work in 10 years? So when I look at the markets uh, at the moment or at all the companies we are serving in our consulting service company, um, a lot of people or a lot of companies try to get all their staff back to office um, and they try to stop home office, uh, stop remote work because um, they didn't really figure out a great way on how to be productive or sustainable um, with the remote work. What do you think? Where are we in 10 years um, when it comes to the type or uh, art we work, we work with? I mean, if these companies didn't figure out how to be productive during the home office time during the pandemic, then either their business just cannot support it or they're lying to themselves, right? Because most companies and there's big meta analyses now did not have a dip in productivity during it. Of course, there's certain fields of work. You can think of doctors, for instance, not good if they're working from the home office, right? But there's quite a few fields. The majority, I think 56% or so jobs can be done at least partially in the home office. So companies that are saying it doesn't work anymore are just lying. And that's mainly for two reasons. One is control, right? Ego of bosses. I mean, we all know this. I, I, I understand it as well, right? If I've been working my entire life like that, and then suddenly this form of control is taken away from me, I would also start questioning the new systems that are coming in, but that is part of change. <laughs> And it has to be said, the problem is, I think, that this entire discourse is basically be done in a binary fashion, right? Either you are for the home office or against the home office. I always get journalists asking this question. And <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not always the biggest fan of contemporary journalism, but that's one of the low points, I think, because you know, what's going to happen within the next 10 years is that companies, different branches, different fields of work are going to continue to have this fight. And it is a fight at the moment, right? Um, about everyone come back to the office, stuff like that, and figure out which duty, which part of work within my field is done best at which point and at which place. And that is something that has to be figured out with a bit of pain as well, right? Because if you force everyone back to the office now and you suddenly notice that all your back-end guys who are suddenly very productive at home, your, I don't know, your IT people and so on, are suddenly getting distracted all the time in the office and their productivity goes down, then you need to be able as manager to figure out, ah, okay, I see why this is happening, right? So the formula needs to be, you know, <laughs> leave your ego behind a bit and figure out where is the right place and the right time for work. No one wants to do a seven hour Zoom meeting. That's not only emotional, physical, but also economic suicide. If that's what you base oh, yeah. your company on. Totally. Um, 
<laughs> so right if you if you have to work creative or iteratively or it's about communication between people for a long time then you got to be in person right but if you need to do concentrated work like writing or whatever then that can be done wherever you feel most comfortable doing it so the 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 more complex answer, which of course journalism doesn't always like to hear, is it is going to become more differentiated where you work, when, at what time, and what you do where. And that is not as satisfying as we're all going to work in the home office or everyone's going to have to go back to the office forever. But reality, the future is always a little bit more complex than contemporary headlines lead us to believe. Yeah. Definitely, I agree with that. Uh, and then we see this definitely also in the um, in, in our um, projects we are executing. <clears throat> so um, do you think um, changing the type of leadership or um, having more aware leaders who can deal with this is the solution or should be the solution for this? I think <laughs> the free market is going to do that all by itself. I mean, oh, okay. if, you're, if, if you're smart enough now, of course, you change that. But if, I mean, I, I work a lot with top management usually. If I come into companies, I'm usually top or I'm down in the teams, right? Middle management, I, as you can probably hear, I, <laughs> I have a few issues with middle management. <laughs> top management doesn't care, right? They care about numbers. And yeah. if the theories are correct, and thus far the numbers indicate that they are, that we want to maximize productivity. And the productivity is highest when you let people work where they want to work at the correct time, most of the time. Um, then suddenly a lot of middle managers are going to become obsolete, right? Now, if you add in AI on top of that, right? Because if you, if, if you seriously think as, as management, your job is just to basically pry on people and control them and track everything they do, I've got really bad news for you that AI is going to be able to basically, as long as you have a system to track it, is going to be able to discern the correct um, consequences from the data way better than you. Right. So if that's if that's your USP, basically, in your <laughs> field of management, you're in trouble. Right. So based based on that, it would be smarter to figure out how do I increase and maximize the human element, the empathic element, because that's what that's the glue of companies mm -hmm. at the end of the day. If, yeah. if, if your only argument is because I say so and if you don't, because then you're going to land on the streets and not have any food and no a roof over your head. It's not going to work nowadays. There's too much wealth for that to apply. So, um, yeah. yeah, basically, I mean, it, it's just, a, it's, I think it's quite a smart way of turning it is not, not to say, look, the management you have done and this controlling stuff is awful and you're an idiot and so on. You say it was really good for a long time, mm -hmm. but now new technology is coming and it's going to be better at that. So if you don't adapt, you're going to become obsolete like every other job. Right. I mean, this shouldn't come to, as a surprise to anyone. Right. Yeah. And especially if you if you call yourself a manager, then you also have to deal with the future somewhat. Right. Because you have to manage for the future. You have to see things coming. And I'm a futurist telling you that is going to happen. So best um, get off the high horse and get back to the drawing board. That's that's my and I again. What middle management has done for a long, long time now worked really, really well. Look at the economic growth we've had for the last yeah, yeah century. But now we can see it's slowing down. The industrial age is slowly coming to a, to an end. The digital age is beginning. And it would be illusionary to think that you can basically continue doing management with the principles of the industrial age. I mean, you're a bad manager if you think like that. That's basically my message. I'm all about productivity. I only care about productivity. If everyone's having fun and everyone's happy, I'm also really cool with that. But mainly economic productivity, individual productivity is interesting to me. Yeah. And if I give you the numbers and say this shows that it is, then that's the way everyone should be following, right? That makes the most sense. Yeah. No, I like this a lot. I um, really do. Because um, what I really like about you um, is that you are straightforward and you just name it like it is. So um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit more about this. You mentioned already AI and want to jump onto this train, of course, <laughs> and uh, yeah. talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. So um, we are now in a situation where we are the first time basically white color workers or people who just were consultants, coaches, trainers, and stuff like that basically created a lot of content or are traveling from stage to stage. A lot of, uh, a lot of people are afraid um, do I have a job or do I have customers in five or 10 years from now as an entrepreneur? 
because what is AI evolving to? Or do somebody need a coach or a trainer or a consultant in 10 years from now? So what's your viewpoint here? <laughs> I don't know if people need consultants and coaches nowadays all the time. I think it's a, <laughs> oh, same I think it's a, for that. <laughs> well, I, I'm in the same business. Yeah, but, I, know. I mean, <laughs> you, you know how it is. If, you, if, if I get 19-year-old uh, life coaches trying to offer me something, I'm <laughs> asking myself what's going on. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a field that's completely overinflated. We know that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, this, is, this is common knowledge. So yeah. a, a bit of um, trimming the fat there is probably not a bad idea anyways to begin yeah. with. So um now as a question to what will what will happen to consultancy it won't disappear what it'll do is a lot of the especially the big big consultancy companies which i've also worked for um their you know their claim to fame is essentially twofold one is they're very good at basically working out all the data that you have they have better data scientists mm -hmm. which i mean yeah, AI is a really good data scientist if you program it correctly. So that argument is going to be a little bit difficult or become continuously more difficult. And the other thing that they usually, the usual function was to go into companies and give CEOs an excuse um, to fire people or to lay people off without them being to blame, which sounds really cynical, but on a team perspective, it's smart. I mean, it's correct, right? If... Sometimes if economics change, you need to trim down, you need to fire a few people. I would totally do the same. I would also see as to how can I keep the spirit within the team the best, right? And you do that by not being to blame completely, <laughs> essentially, right? So those are the two functions that, that big consultancies basically had. And I think on the empathic humane function, which was the second part, I see potential there. Maybe not only in the excuse to fire people, but... I'm sure we can work on that, you know, what, what people used to call soft skills, right? But mm. I kind of got burnt a little bit, the term, but soft skills are ha having a comeback now, of course, right? Because all the hard skills, which is basically numbers, we're not better at that than the machines are. Or maybe still now, but within the next five to 10 years, you can forget that, right? So it's going to be a big comeback of soft skills because, yeah, I said the first part of the numbers game, I'm sorry, robots are better. <laughs> that. oh yeah it's true <laughs> it I, is. I'm not, I'm, you're not quicker than a calculator i'm not quicker than a calculator but yeah. i'm still more empathetic than a calculator and i hope you are too. <laughs> <laughs> at least we are for now yeah, for now yeah <laughs> for now <laughs> and it would look weird you have just a microphone or a or or um, a robot on stage instead of you or me or something like that so at least for oh, now, you... it would look weird I can tell you there's a lot of people there's a lot of people in my field of futurism that want to that want to do this kind of stuff because they come very strong from a technology focused perspective yeah. I come I come from sociology right I you know I'm half German half English you can can hear a little bit um and the especially the German this humanism you know romantic humanism something that the Germans invented some time ago um that's kind of the approach that I have to technology in the future right try to I think I think from the human perspective first, not the machine perspective. Mm -hmm. What can they do for us? Not what will they do to us. That is what um, I'm interested in, and that's why also all of these, you know, scenarios of basically all scenarios as it pertains to uh, artificial intelligence have basically been ruined by Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? By Terminator. <laughs> as soon as you say that's what everyone thinks of. And oh, yeah. it's so much, it's more mundane, it's more boring than that, but it's also better than that, right? Because it'll Terminator make our life easier. Better. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, awesome. Uh, so uh, let's let's stay a little bit more here. So um, we, we talked about the, about the big corporations, about the big consulting companies. Um, and I totally agree with you that this market is fully overcrowded, uh, not because I uh, have a, a problem with competition, but I have a problem with bad service and stupid consultants, coach and coaches and trainers. And in my opinion, I'm 23 years in this business now. And unfortunately, a lot of not so good ones are also out there, but with mm. also in all other industries. Um, but talk about the solopreneur. So basically the one man show, how, needs, how they need to adapt 
over the next couple of years that they can basically use or add AI to their consulting or uh, training business um, to stay relevant in the marketplace or ideally to be even more beneficial and valuable to the customers? I don't know if they do. I don't know if, if maybe if, look, big, big AI systems, you need a lot of brain power to make that work. And let's be real, the big four are going to do that the best. That's just fact. So I think maybe as a as a solo consultant or a, yeah, well, an entrepreneur might be different, but especially on the consultancy side, it might be, of course, you've got to keep up to date and figure out how it works. But you're going to be washed out by the by the big guys when it comes to that. So the smarter thing to do would be to focus on what you do best. And usually solo entrepreneurs and also solo coaches and so on are extremely good at networking. Right. That's that's what keeps you afloat there. You gotta be a people's person. You gotta be able to catch the room, catch people. And that already leads me to my conclusion there, which is that I think the human humane element, the empathic element is probably what you're best in. You should probably focus on that. That doesn't mean ignore AI, but it means don't invest the fifty K you have lying around into some consultancy AI system because A because a lot of them are not gonna work still now. Yeah. And uh B, I don't think that's gonna be your strength. Right. So, um, right. It's my theory. I know it's again, saying it as it is. And I, I can imagine a million people right now being like, it will make my life so much easier and everything. Yeah. yeah maybe for back end stuff for sure. But front end consulting on AI, if you really want to be cutting edge, you either have to focus solely on that, um, mm -hmm. or leave it up to the big guys and focus on what you do best. Yeah, I mean, unless you're an IT consultant, of course. I mean, then obviously, yeah. but I think we're talking business consultants. Yeah, yeah, definitely, we are, we are, we are. Yeah. So, especially when it comes to the back end, um, I would highly recommend to think about this for all entrepreneurs. Basically, I mean, we saw it in my own company. We started to um, implement AI systems, but we did not uh, bought AI or we did not leverage AI to do the consulting work, but mm. for every single task what is this possible and what makes sense in the back end so creating um content or media and uh texts um and basically in our consulting um service we have a lot of um executive reports or a lot of documentation to do which is more or less always the same for a similar project mm. and here we literally save hundreds of hundreds of hours every single month already um, because there are a lot of um, governmental granted projects also going on in um, in, in Austria. And the, the reports you need to write are basically not sophisticated, always the same. They're boring, but, boring as hell. Yeah, right, I know them. Right. I know them very well, yeah. And <laughs> basically, we needed, to in, uh, we needed to invest 10 hours on average per project for this before we uh, used AIs for this. And we started to implement it at the beginning of the year. And in the meantime, we are down to 20 minutes per project from 10 hours to 20 minutes. And this is, in my opinion, the, the highest or the biggest advantage what companies or what small companies or solopreneurs should think about at the moment. I would definitely not recommend um, offering AI supported coaching or training or stuff like mm. that or having an avatar or, or, or crazy things like that. So I not definitely not yet, probably in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, one more thing I want to ask you before we wrap this up, because I know we are already at the end of our time, but uh, just a very short question. Um, my view is that a lot of people will need to adapt their skill set massively over the next five to 10 years, or basically even the next three years to stay relevant in the marketplace or also as an entrepreneur, because a lot of people, uh, a lot of stuff at the back end can be supported with AI models already when it comes to content creation, text, um, project articles, um, executive reports or something like that. How how do you think um, we can support these people to be able to transform their skill sets, to be able to use this AI support in the future? Mm. It's a big question of uh, human machine interaction, right? Like where, where, where are the intersectionality points and what can you give off and what do you do better? And 
I mean, as you said, like I, I remember executive reporting. Uh, I mean, that stuff was always so boring and so dry. And when I saw what ChatGPT started writing, I was like, I recognize this style, right? <laughs> it's executive reports. <laughs> so that's perfect. As you said, that's a great use case um, for it. I mean, how, that's that's always the question at the moment. Like, how do you how do you stay up to date? How do you stay relevant? Because there's a lot of snake oil salesman running around trying to sell you it digital ai courses at the moment yeah um i'm hope for what i'm hoping will happen is that we actually get because you know technology is global and especially ai is developing globally and very quickly uh that we actually manage to for once create like a global digital certificate like you know like a driving license um, which means you've got it. And then you can have that in different shades and, you know, all the way up to <laughs> I'm the master of this. Um, because, I mean, AI is going to, AI is a bloody black, black box, right? If you look into it, like most of us, we just, we just see what we put in, we see what comes out. And there's going to be a lot, a lot of snake oil salesmen who are just going to trick people, right? right. If you have the certificate and hey, for, even for my blockchain people, yeah, remember blockchain, you can even save your, or have your certificate on the blockchain so you can prove that it's real, that it's not just a screenshot of, of it or whatever. And then, fantastically, you can actually do the courses. I mean, obviously, it's going to need a course. Um, and then you have a certificate. And I think that would help a lot. But it, it needs to be... I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think at the moment, the EU is doing some pretty good moves when it comes to legislating AI. I mean, we're also the only ones doing it. So, obviously, it's the best <laughs> we have. Um, <laughs> But um, still, I think I think there that that would be a good thing. It needs to be super national at least, so so that we know. And then that that would help both sides. It would help the people who are trying to adapt and keep up to date, and it would help customers, future customers, discern whether you are good enough for them or not. Right. So I think that is that is something that we need to get to. Otherwise, it's just there's just going to be so much. Excuse my expression. So many bullshit artists running around oh, yeah. um, okay. tricking people, which I think would just not be not be very helpful. Yeah, no, I definitely, I agree with you, Tristan. Um, so thank you so much. I could go on and on and on, uh, but I value your time. So if somebody wants to reach out to you and connect with you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? <laughs> Find me in the internet. No, I, <laughs> I guess I, I reckon for business stuff, just uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, but I'm... I'm not such a huge social media user or fan, but if you write me a message, I will reply. So um, I think that's the best way. And then we will take it from there. That's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. So again, thank you so much. I really, really had a, a very interesting time with you the last couple of minutes. And I'm sure all the listeners out there uh, just learned a lot about this and will uh, want to connect with you. So have a great day. And for all of you listeners out there, just implement and think about what Tristan um, just told you and have a great and successful entrepreneurial journey. Thanks for today or now. Bye-bye. <laughs>